The words that Chris read to us uh, were from the churches at Corinth. And Corinth was some kind of place. Corinth was a metropolis some 90,000 strong by the first century. That's a big city. And like most of the civilized world, Corinth had been conquered numerous times, and each time a part of the conquering culture had remained there. During the time of Paul, technically uh, the Roman Empire governed Corinth, but Corinth was almost beyond governing all kinds of people, all kinds of races, all kinds of cultures, anything and everything went in Corinth. The only thing that mattered was that you made enough money to survive and live the life you wanted to live. It was a competitive, a hard-working town like, oh, I don't know, New Orleans. And uh, Paul was determined to meet Corinth on its own terms. So he established a series of churches there, uh, uh, right in Corinth, he, all kinds of churches. And, and, and uh, Paul was not approved like many of us like to think. Uh, he established house churches there. You didn't even have to go to church. You could meet in somebody's house. How radical was that? It was like having a Saturday service. Who ever thought of such a thing as that? There was a pagan temple on every corner of Corinth for every kind of worship and desire. Kind of like New Orleans. And far from telling the Christians to stay away from the pagans, Paul encouraged his church members to be friendly with the pagans and even eat with them. Christ's followers understood that God was the source of all food. So what difference did it make what the pagans thought about food? Just be true to yourself, he told them. It's like thinking people today. You know how we talk about people. We know some of what best friends are. And you fill in the blank. Their particular uh, sex or orientation or race, it may not be yours, but that doesn't keep us from becoming friends and having an, an honorable association with them. And yes, Paul encouraged slaves to obey their masters, but in the first century, being a slave was a business relationship, not a symbol of cruel and inferior, less than human status. In fact, Paul proudly referred to himself as a slave of the resurrected Christ. Paul's idea of slavery was a badge of honor, an honest day's work. In no way was it a misfortune. No. Paul didn't stand in anybody's way. In this text that uh, was read in our hearing today, that Chris read, Paul said, we are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants or slaves of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. By commending ourselves in every way, what that means is we're putting our best foot forward, the best that we can, so people know who we are. If we had lived back then or they lived now, they would have had Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and websites and fellowship meetings during the week. Whatever it takes to get our brand out there. We are getting our brand of belief out of these walls and into the community. We are a 24-7 community center with Alibi and Alateen and theater classes and Overeaters Anonymous classes. We are an all-needs-met church, and that's the kind of church that Paul wanted that first century, those first century churches in Corinth to be, ready to meet the needs of the people. But, and there's always a but, for all of his conversion, Paul was bred old school. And for Paul, being a man, being a patriarch, being a father to and interacting with the churches, if you will, it was a matter of functionality, not existentiality. Now what I mean by that is, back in Paul's time, no one talked about alternative lifestyles. What was that? Relationships out of wedlock, what? Same-sex couples. Mm -mm. In first century religion, there was no law for that. There was no language for that. There was no honorable language for 
anything other than women and men in marriage where their spiritual responsibility was to produce more children for the Hebrew faith. Paul became a Jesus preacher, but he was already deeply steeped in an earlier time. Paul was thrust into the future, trying to explain where God was leading this new phenomenon called the church. But perhaps he expressed it in the culture from which he had been born. Paul was old school. Where the timeless Jesus said in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, Fear not, for I have overcome the world. From our 21st century vantage point, we lowly listen and overhear Paul's caution-filled descriptions of afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, and even death in our future visited on us simply for being Christ's church. Your dads may have cautioned like Paul. Uh, my dad was certainly old school like Paul. While some dads, they may say, fear not, the world is your oyster. You can accomplish anything. You can overcome the world. My dad was born old school. <laughs> my dad grew up as part of the pre-World War II northern migration of people of color looking for a new life, looking for new opportunities more acceptance. You know, they're building cars in Detroit. Let's go there. They're doing glass in Toledo. Let's go there. But at the same time, being thoroughly schooled in the old Southern life of deference in order to get along and be safe. Life for my dad was hard, and he accepted that. His job was to teach me how to be safe. My dad was never one for sentimentality. My dad always fought hard, and he fought to win. Oh, I've been in an argument with him. He could argue, and my dad could think on his feet, and you had to prove your point. And you got more points from my dad for standing up for yourself than if you did if you tried to get everything right and hoped he'd give you a hug. My dad thought you could endure and survive just about anything as long as you were logical and if you were, as the Apostle Paul might have cautioned you to be, careful. I would say to my dad, I love you, dad. And he would always reply, well, I love you too. And be careful. <laughs> That was the psychology and methodology he used on his family. Successful living was equated with being wary, being vigilant, being watchful, being prudent, and being careful. Old school. Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church of Charlotte, South Carolina is decidedly old school. The church was established in 1787. That's the end of the 18th century. One of the founders of the church was killed for leading a slave revolt. The church continued to meet underground when black churches were outlawed in South Carolina. Dr. King preached from the pulpit of Mother Emanuel during the Civil Rights era. The sense of warm welcome that you will experience at Mother Emanuel is there, but it comes from a very historic place. The people who attend that church, like we do, they think of their very halls as hallowed. That is Mother Emanuel's uh, psychology. That is their methodology. The age span of those in that Bible study this week at Mother Emanuel range from the very young to senior citizens. There were old school saints in that Bible study who had seen a lot of changes. There were educated people in that congregation, and there were probably, uh, and there probably had been people at Mother Emanuel who had probably at one time been nannies and chauffeurs and cooks 
and babysitters, and they probably brought their little charges with them when they came to weekday Bible study and said, you play over there and you be good while I'm in Bible study. Mother Emmanuel was used to welcoming those who looked different because the church was formed in a culture where people of different cultures brushed up against each other and worked through the antebellum South and the Civil War and segregation and learned to live together and respect and honor each other. Mother Emmanuel was probably used to welcoming those who looked different because the church is downtown in a diverse area that looks like Paul's corn. Mother Emmanuel was probably used to welcoming those who look differently because that is the sole purpose of any church that professes Jesus Christ. A proud people, a welcoming people who love their church as much as we love ours. I imagine Mother Emmanuel is a church good at converting. And after all, one of the ministers on the staff of Mother Emmanuel, African. Methodist Episcopal Church is a converted Baptist minister. You don't develop that kind of love and that kind of pride unless you come from old, old stories. And our hearts break for them and for ourselves as we still exist in this violent, unfriendly, and uneven culture. But their public reaction to the senseless violence in the heart of the South has so much to teach us. Hallelujah. A young man who sought them out but reported that they were so welcoming to them that he almost didn't murder them. An indictment judge who, as the victim's family showed up in court, were charged to remember that they were not the only victims, the perpetrators families were victims also. Yet, when the victims' families had their say, they had joined together and prayed together in public and in private and standing up one family after another saying to this disturbed young man, and disturbed is the best description of him, they said, you have hurt us beyond measure, and yet I, and yet we forgive you. We are at this very moment praying God's mercy on your soul. You are cruel and broken, yes, but you are not the other. You are just as we are, children of God, just as we believe ourselves to be. What kind of reaction is that? Well, let me tell you, this horrible painting that this church is responding to is not just that church. It is the church at her finest hour. That is what you and I are called to do. Whenever we are violated and broken and yet continuing to do God's work, to stand up for God, prevailing against the gates of hell. This is what the Apostle Paul, using his old school psychology and Hebrew methodology, is saying to us down through history in this text when he cautioned this way. I speak to you as to children. You may be treated as impostors and yet be true. You may be treated as unknown and yet be well known. You may be treated as dying and yet somehow survive. As sorrowful, yet always finding something to be glad about. As poor, yet be wealthy in the spirit of Christ. As having nothing, and yet possessing everything because the parental love of God the Creator, God the risen Savior, and God the ever-abiding Holy Spirit will always be with you. We will be as careful as we can, but Little White Chapel will keep the doors open. Danger is close at hand, but so is the case.